Everyone can, everyone can hear me? Yes. Great. So today we are going to talk about monitoring performance of mobile applications at scale. Right? So I think most of us here are React Native developers and Native developers as well. And we have a notion that you know React Native applications runs a little slow than the native application. At Dream 11, we have achieved the feat that we have matched exactly the performance of native applications with our React Native application. Right? So let's understand what do we mean by performance. Right? So performance is a measure of how well your users are able to use the application. Right? And a general notion that it includes usually crashes, ANR, latencies, CPU, memory, frame rates, etc. Right? But often we encounter performance issues and we tackle a lot of those. Right? So a, th a lot of third party tools like Firebase, New Relic provide out of the box support for APN. And you must have, you know, fixed a lot of crashes using the stack traces provided for crashes and ENR. And use profilers to debug CPU, memory and network usages. Correct? But often you receive a problem statement from your users or your, you know, customers that your app is running slow. Okay? The app is slow, right? It's a notional value. You don't have any metric to define whether the app, how do you call the app is slow? How much time does it take to execute a particular operation? So now we will try to define a data point to uh, ensure that we know whether our application is slow or not in pre-production as well as post-production environment and we will look how it, it scales with, how it changes the scale. So let's first try to understand how the user behaves with the application. So a user interacts with the application with a lot of micro actions such as clicking on a card or waiting for a page to load. And what happens when a user is doing those actions? There is some uh, you, uh, CPU we are using, some memory we are using. Basically, we are using the mobile's resources to perform those actions. And we are also generating a telemetry data, which we often call as event. Those events can be business events as well as the technical events. Now, if I am able to utilize these metrics, the CPU usage, memory usage, network usage or app resources and this event telemetry data somehow, to calculate how my app is working right now, I might be able to come with a data point, right? So today we will cover, uh, we will understand this the user interactions, basically breaking down users' behavior into smaller interactions, how we measure performance of those, inter of those interactions and the challenges that we will face at scale. So let's first understand what an interaction is. So an interaction are small meaningful steps a user takes from point A to point B, right? So uh, such as like, you know, you click on a match card in a Dream 11 application and you land on the contest home page or you click on save team and you are landed on the my team page where your team is created. So if I'm somehow able to measure the performance of these interactions and combine them together, I can know whether my app is working fast or slow, right? Now, how do I define the success of these interactions, right? It's a general term, again, success of interaction. There is no data point. But we need data to come up with values to op optimize or improve. So how do we usually define the success of any interaction? So success of any interaction can be uh, computed by three properties. One is how fast the interaction took place, whether the, whether the user was able to complete the interaction or not and how smooth the interaction was. Now let's take example of a particular interaction such as shown in this GIF. A user is clicking on a match card and landing on a contest home page. And what's happening in the background? We are using some CPU and memory as well as generating an event tray. Now if I take the example of the T0 event, basically when the interaction started, when I clicked on the match card page, the T0 event and the page load event which generated when the interaction ended, let's call it the T1 event. So if I am able to subtract the timestamp of T1 from T0, I am able to calculate how much time does it took to complete this particular interaction, right? Similarly, if I have to say, you know, how do I ensure that the user are able to complete the interaction? So if I am able to get the ratio of T1 events received over T0 events triggered, I will get the information of how many users were able to complete this interaction. And similarly, the frame rate, 
that happened during this interaction between T0 and T1 will tell me how smooth my interaction was. Right? So once we have established this notion that you know we know what interactions are. So interactions are small steps that user takes to complete the flow, right? And we know what the T0 and T1 event are. Now we need to come up with a framework which we will call it performance measurement framework which needs to be agnostic of aversions, platforms, teams as well as organizations, right? So the same framework that should apply for my organization should be applied to your organization as well. And this framework should work on both Android, iOS and can work on web, web for web developers as well, right? So let's look at the five key tenets of this performance measurement framework. The first tenet is to generate the data. We first need to generate the data to measure, right? The second tenet is to measure and analyze the data we generated during those interactions. The third is to derive a result out of those analysis and what actions do we need to take on those results. So if we combine these five tenets, we will come across a framework which handles all the problems in Android or iOS regarding the latency issue or the slowness of the application. And we might be able to come up with a data point which we will see later. So we understood that you know uh, we need a T0 event and T1 event to track any uh, success of any interaction, right? But how do we generate that data? Right? The one way is that we all I think do it and we all have done it in the past as well to put events at every step. Right? But let's assume your application spans across 300 features and has a code base of I don't know, 1000, 2000 lines or maybe it can span up to lakhs of lines right? and that means a lot of files and whenever you have to insert an event any, at any specific point of time it becomes a pain. Usually we all have that problem when the product manager comes at the end, you know, I want to insert this event here and there and there and you have to rewrite your whole flow just to accommodate certain properties in that particular event. Now to circumvent this particular problem, we have come up with a framework which we call as event taxonomy. The event taxonomy is based and inspired that on user events are the atoms of analysis. Any analysis that you need to do, you need to trigger certain events, right? And those user events can be categorized into finite buckets. You don't need to have infinite events in the application. There are only finite buckets that are present in the application which can serve your purpose for all the analysis, right? Such as press, navigation or any I.O. call, right? This is not an uh, exclusive list. There are a lot of buckets as well, but again, these are not infinite. They are like finite, uh, 10, 12 buckets that are present, okay? So what this uh, framework does is it injects the code at a central level of every button press, every navigation that is happening for every API call that is going on in the application and it, and it injects a uniquely identified prop on each of those events. For example, when I looked at the interaction before, there was a press event that was happening on the match card. Okay? So the event there will be press and the prop pass will be match card 0. Right? And when I landed on the next page, so the event would fire will be page loaded and the prop will be component, uh, sorry, contest home. Right? What I have done here is I have auto instrumented my whole application with a finite line of codes. And every new code that is being injected in the application need not to write any additional code to trigger events. So that serves for business use cases as well as technical use cases. Right? Also, this provides you with a fine grained control over how many data you want to uh, emit at the production level. At Dream 11, we have around 250 million users across the application and our key concurrency goes as high as 15 million. That means 15 million users are trying to access the application in one minute. Right? And consider if one user is generating 1000 events in a session, how many data a 15 million users base is going to generate. So that means huge amount of data is being generated at production. So we definitely need fine grain control. And we, as we discussed the earlier uh, implementation, it requires zero dev effort. So developers are technically happy. And 
What it also does is, since it's generic events with props, which are also can be passed at the runtime, it empowers you to track any interactions at any point of time. So now that we have solved the problem of data generation, which was the first tenet of our uh, framework, the second tenet goes to the measure analysis result and actions that we need to take on those aspects. But those measure analysis varies from pre-production to post-production and you will ask why. So in the pre-production, the characteristics of the behavior are different than a production environment. In a pre-production environment, you generate finite data. Right? Basically, how many times you are going to run the application? Maybe let's say, odd case 10,000, but that's even too high. We all, when, whenever we are testing our features, we like try to run the application one or two times and we are done with it. The environment is controlled. You don't have infinite number of devices, right? In Android, as I last checked, we, the Android framework supports around 18,000 unique devices, right? But in our pre production environment, we usually have one, two, or maybe hardly three devices that you can test your application on. Similarly, now, when we have finite data and control environment, the measurement and analysis becomes critical. We need to define the numbers as something which are statistically significant. So, and what is a statistically significant number? So any statistical significant number has three properties. It has a mean, it has a standard deviation, and an error rate. So our Measurement and analysis are done on error rate, mean, and standard deviation. And the analysis is done against certain thresholds, right? And the results usually are compared against thresholds and are output is usually that the threshold has been breached. And the action that you need to take over these results is usually to attribute it to certain teams. For example, when you have a team of 400 strong developers, right, working on the same code base, you need to define which commit broke this particular interaction or which commit broke this particular issue. Okay. Now we know that you know we, we have understood how we can generate the data, we understood the characteristics of this data, and we know how to measure and analyze these things. Okay, but how do I go on and do this? The app contains a lot of interactions, right? And if I go on manually keep on running all those interactions, that is going to take huge number of amount of time and my release will get delayed infinitely. So we need to come up with a system where the machines can do the work for us and the developers do the thinking. So let's look at a pipeline that we'll see to generate this kind of data. So this is how a pre-production pipeline to generate the mean standard deviation and error rate for any run can look like. So you have your app build, whether it's Android or iOS, doesn't matter. Okay, you select a runtime. A runtime refers here is to the environment that you want to run in. For example, do you want to mock your APIs or not? And uh, what is the latency you are going to mock your APIs with? And what is the device that you want to run your application on? For example, the data that is coming on a higher end device and lower end device is going to differ. So we usually prefer to run our application on lower end devices. That gives us a pretty much idea of how it's going to behave for high end devices as well. So, the developer now has an app built, he has selected a runtime, let's consider it a lower end device and now the magic comes at the iteration level. So whenever we are doing it manually, the maximum iteration that we can do is either 1, 2 or let's say if we are very generous, 10. But what this framework provides you is the ability to run your application 1000 times and what it helps, when you, when you are running this data 1000 times, it is calculating the T1 minus T0 of that data. Remember, we talked about interaction and how we can measure how fast the interaction is. Now, this pipeline is generating T1 minus T0 data of in this particular interaction going from match card to contest home 1000 times or let's say 100 times. And it's calculating the mean standard deviation and error rate on that data. And why are these standard deviation and error rate are important? So if your standard deviation and error rate is high, that means your data is not statistically significant or relevant because there's a lot of variety in your data and you're not able to attribute whether this is the correct value or not. So we are looking for lower standard deviation and lower error rates. Now, 
this further is done goes through the analysis now every as we talked earlier right every runtime has a different baseline for a faster device the baseline is going to be slow uh, lower and uh, for a higher end device the baseline is going to be higher right so the analysis funnel pulls the baseline data for the specific runtime and it also fetches the thresholds required for that particular interaction for example i want i do not want my interact interaction to have a 100 ms increase in every relay right so my threshold here is going to be 100 milliseconds and the baseline for that could be uh, 200 2000 ms or something like that so your thresholds and your baseline needs to be defined in junction it is not possible that you can have a 100 milliseconds ka baseline and a 100 milliseconds ka threshold because making the data rel relevant is going to be a big challenge there so define your thresholds according to your baseline and once you have the threshold you have the mean you have the baseline you can do a simple mathematical calculation and tell whether a threshold has been breached or not and once the threshold has been breached you can simply just notify the teams you know your commit broke this particular interaction and it's going to cost us in production so make sure this either this is fixed or remove your commit from the master branch right and how many times you want to run this pipeline it completely depends on you and your use case some people prefer to run it on every commit some people uh, try to run it on let's say after every 2 hour sometimes it runs nightly it's just a function of cost how much money you are willing to spend on this particular interaction because this the core principle of this system is to scale indefinitely right infinitely sorry now let's look at the data generated by this particular pipeline as you can see on this graph the x axis represent the count of the iterations that we run so here we ran this uh, data for 200 iterations and the blue line represents the data generated for each iteration by this uh, particular pipeline the standard deviation mean and error rate are also displayed in this particular slide you can see the error rate and the standard deviation is very low which means i simply say that my interaction is taking 0.409 milliseconds to complete and now i have a data point to measure how fast my interaction is now what it helps you with so it gives you certain strategic advantages so when your users are coming or when your customer success team is coming to you with issues like you know the app is running slow or any product manager is coming running for your life then you know you have made the application slower or not you can simply say the data does not say the same how can you say the application is slow okay so it provides you a release on release analysis how your interactions are working and massive advantage in debugging performance issues across version for example i got let's say my app version is 2.0.0 i did a massive refactor and i got a performance delta of 500 ms now i know in pre production itself that you know my application is going to run slow rather than waiting for the release and somebody to complain that you know your application is running slow so this gives you a massive advantage you can compare the commit what happened for this interaction between these two commits where this data vary and so and so forth now now we have a advantage to us you know we know everything in pre production and it's good and you know every developer is running their particular pipeline and everything are going smooth in isolation every team is getting notified and you are ensuring that whatever is going into production is in line with your baselines or the thresholds that you have set for your performance correct but once you move to production the characteristics change drastically right in production you have massive amount of data as well as an uncontrolled environment as i mentioned earlier right like around 18000 devices are supported by android ecosystem so having this much uncontrolled environment and a lot of users doing a lot of things some people just on the developer option some somebody uh, on the off their animation somebody has a battery pack running you know it's a completely uncontrolled environment now in this controlled uncontrolled environment to have an analysis on statistical data like mean standard deviation and error rate becomes impossible because the amount of data generated is so high the iterations that are running in the applications are so high the data that you might get 
will become irrelevant there. So in production, we conform to P95, P90 and P50 values of the data coming. And the result is a trend, how the, how the P95 has worked over the time. And the action you usually take is the change in that trend. For example, if my P95 dip to let's say 100 milliseconds for one minute, right? That means something is wrong somewhere in my application, right? What I do then? Earlier, I used to attribute to a certain comment, certain teams. In production, we create incidents. An incident is nothing but a group of people who are responsible for the on-call processes as well as the team leaders that are going across the application. So an incident is created with the relevant teams tab and they can know, you know, this particular interaction had a dip in 300 millisecond. So this particular interaction usually uh, deals with these finite microservices. And let's include all people to debug this issue as fast as possible, right? Because in production, at grade level, our goal is to reduce the MTTR drastically. Now, let's take an example, right? You all must be fan of IPL. Dream 11 is a big fan of IPL, by the way. So during the IPL final, uh, from 7 p.m. to 7.30 p.m., when the lineups are announced, we get a huge concurrency, as I mentioned earlier, the 15 million concurrency. That means 15 million users are able to use my are using my application in one minute. Now, if on a particular critical interaction, such as mass card to contest home click, or a join button to join the contest, there is a dip of 100 milliseconds in performance. Right? That means some users are not able to complete the flow in finite time. And I only have the half hour window to generate the maximum revenue possible. Right? So if I am able to detect those 100 millisecond dip in real time, I will be able to notify the teams immediately and they will be able to take actions accordingly and recover the system. Plus, this also gives the earlier pre-production analysis ensures that I rarely have this issue in production rather than the occasional occurrence. So let's look how the production pipeline is going to evolve with scale. So in pre-production environment, we had a finite uh, system, right? We had a runtime, we were selecting number of iterations, but such uh, luxury are not afforded in production. In production, the amount of data generated is massive. So we require massive systems to handle that kind of data. So the first, uh, the first uh, box in this particular uh, diagram represents the app. The apps are generating massive amount of data at every point of time. Uh, for example, let's say 1000 events for a session for 15 million users. Now imagine the quantum of that data. Let's say TBs. Okay. The apps transfer the data to the proxy service, which is responsible to ensure whether the request the app is sending is authenticated and ensures a particular sampling whenever required because scale breaks everything. And this data is further pushed into Kafka streams. Kafka streams are nothing but queues which where the events is pushed and is ready for processing, which is then transferred to a Flink processor. Flink is nothing but a, a in a simpler words, a fancy query language like SQL, but it can run a lot more operations on a product on a streams of data, right? So this Flink processor, which ho which is hosted on a uh, Kubernetes order in EC2 instance based on your particular choice, holds the business logic to create this P95 and P99 values, and which is further stored in a database for further analysis. And this data is then consumed by two services. One is the alert engine, which keeps on checking whether there is a break in trend, and second a visual dashboard for devs to actually see what exactly happened. Because you will feel a little handicapped, right? If there is an alert buzzing and you are not able to know what is happening with the data. So we'll look how this translates into a dashboard. So if you see, this is how a dashboard will look like when we push this data to a Grafana dashboard. Again, this is a very simpler version of what we use at Dream 11. It's a very complex dashboard there. It has a lot of uh, funnels, analysis, and values going on with each service is putting a lot of data and application performing a lot of data. But for the sake of this presentation, I have simplified it to P95, P50, as well as P90 only. Okay. So as you can see, this particular graph 
provides me all the values in real time. When I say real time, I am saying less than one minute. So when a user is generating data on the application, within less than one minute, I know what's the P95 of that particular set of users. So this one minute, again, is a challenge that we face at scale because the latencies becomes crucial when you are dealing with scale. So now, whenever an, uh, an issue occurs on an application, within one minute, the, the dashboard knows you know something is going wrong with the oh, and the alert triggers and somebody acts on it. What it also provides is filter on low cardinality values. Now, what are low cardinality values? You will say. So, low cardinality values are such as platform. So, basically, for most of the events, the platform are going to be either web, Android, or iOS, or the app version, the network provider, as well as the app. Mm, sorry, the OS version as well as the state in which users are using the application. Why we have included state? You will ask, right? So. We faced an issue in the, our application where certain users in Jammu and Kashmir were not able to use the application and this system came handy then and there. So what it does is it tracks all the interactions on all the values across the application for all the user base and checks for the threshold breach. So this system detected that you know, the, P9, the P50 and the P95 for Jammu Kashmir users has increased and created an incident and found that you know Geo was having certain issues in Jammu and Kashmir due to which users are not able to use the application. So yeah, uncontrolled environment, right? You don't have a lot of control on things going on. So this provides you filter on low cardinality values, provides a real-time P95, P90, and P75 values, and raise alerts on top of values in over a given period of time. Now let's look at some challenges that will face at scale. But again, sorry, the strategic advantage. We need not we need to just take these actions, right? Because everything costs something to do. And you have to do it because it gives you certain advantage, right? So the strategic advantage of it is it provides holistic view of the system performance in real time. Note that you will say, you know, I have systems like New Relic, Instagram, Firebase going on. These do not provide you values in real time because at scale which Dream 11 works, they also break. Right? So the maximum later, uh, the TAT they can provide us is let's say 24 hours, which is too high for us. So we built our own system, and it also gives you a business impact if one part of your system goes down. Now consider a scenario: the Dream 11 has around 500 or 600 odd microservices working in the back end and a lot of users consuming those on app application. Now, if one database one database node in one microservice is down, how will you, you will get an alert somewhere, right? You know, the latency has increased, but how will you know what part of the app is actually impacted by this particular node? Because when you scale things to 500 microservices, the graph goes like haywire. Everybody is contacting with everything, something goes there, something goes there. So this gives you a clear picture of but something has gone down and these are the interactions that are impacted and you can clearly see okay this went down so these five flows saw a dip of this much latency in the application and you can clearly correlate with the business impact and that particular time and make better judgment call on prioritization of those issues now let's look at some challenges that you often face at scale so the scalability of these tools itself becomes a challenge right it's easier to scale for one with one lakh users or two lakh users, but it's a different ball game when you scale for 250 million users. And those many users, when accessing the application directly, uh, sometimes you know the firebase goes down as well for us. So yeah, so we need special provisions to you know uh, account for the bandwidth that this particular data is going to consume. Second. As we grow in user base as well as uh, you know uh, the amount of devices that we have and uh, all of that, and with users come different different problems. So a lot of tools like New Relic, uh, Firebase, and Instagram sort of like that does not have all the features required to provide you to help debug these things faster. The third point is, as I mentioned earlier, 
we need thresholds to be breached. Now, what happens if you incorrectly calibrate a threshold? That means you are assigning incorrect issues to your developers and the developers are wasting a lot of time. Right? So at scale up, at which we hold, if we have incorrect thresholds, that means all of our developers are either fixing issues or doing something else rather than building what is good for users. Right? And the fourth is the latency in data processing. As I said, right, so many app uh, application users are pushing data to it, and my system needs to process it with a latency of one minute. But what happens if I push the latency to five minutes or ten minutes to optimize? Right? It increases my mean time to recover. And the more time I take to recover an incident or an outage, the more losses to business. And if you try to optimize on all these things, right? the increased licensing and infrastructure cost becomes a nightmare and it's huge when you scale so yeah so uh, i already talked about so this is what it for the performance aspect of the application and how we usually monitor the performance of the application at scale in pre production and post production and now I'm going to talk a little bit about DreamSports Labs as well. So DreamSports Labs is an open source initiative where we empower users to use the tools that we use internally as well as try to maintain a lot of abandoned libraries which are used by the community. You can go to this link, you can search for DreamSports Lab on GitHub, you will see, we are as Kunal also mentioned, we are maintaining fast image. We have recently released a wrapper for MQTT on React Native and the third part is uh, those of you who are React Native developers know that there is a React version coming every six months right now if you have to take a call whether to upgrade my React version or not you need to do certain performance benchmarking as well right so we have recently launched a website which gives you a comparison of performance benchmarks of all the versions available starting from 0.73.0 over the scale as well as the methodology adapted by the React Native team itself. So you can see the graph there and compare how your React versions are going to perform when you upgrade your application. That's it guys, I think uh, I have taken a lot of time today. But yeah, that's it from my side. Uh, we have...